Welcome everyone. I'm very happy that you decided to join this webinar because um, what we're going to be discussing here, uh, there's nothing not to not to like about it. It's one of the most um, one of the most beautiful things that we have in this world, tenderness, and in fact. The, uh, the Tibetan word that's going to be used a lot here, sewa, it's probably what, um, if I'm not mistaken, this probably is the closest that, um, that comes to what we understand with love, Tibetan word for love. Of course, as Ziga Kontrumich is going to be pointing out, then love comes with a lot of associations and the, you could say the word love is, is, is understood in so many different ways. And in some way, um, using a word like tsewa enables us to speak about um, this profound sentiment in a much, you could say, without the same kind of um, without the same kind of luggage that we might have with with other words. But what we're going to be discussing here is something that's basic to everything that we're doing in the Buddhist teaching. And that is taking our mind out of a small place and into something that's much greater. And so tenderness, tenderness is this warmth that extends to others. That, if you like, is part of what we call emptiness, shunyata. And real shunyata is the absence of the ordinary grasping around the self. And as such is the space where we open up to the other. So emptiness is endowed with sewa, tenderness, and tenderness is endowed with emptiness. These things are absolutely inseparable. And as such, we would want to understand how everything in Buddhism really operates within the same, you could say, sphere. And we can call it, we can call it love, we can call it wisdom, we can call it so many different things. Just like if we talk about the sun, you know, we can say, well, the, the sun gives light. We can also say that the sun gives warmth. We can describe the sun. What does the sun look like? Well, it's round, it's, it's bright, it's bright, etc. We can describe in some, but we're just talking about the same thing. So we're very fortunate that we have someone like Ziga Kontrumbuja, who, who's, um, who has engaged with the modern world and um, understand how, understands the many doors with which we can, we can approach this greatness of mind, we can approach the notion of enlightenment. So, um, <clears throat> so um, I'm very happy to be here with you and I'll do my very best to uh, do justice to the subject matter. Um, as always, it applies that what I'm really doing with this book is really just, I'm just promoting it. I'd want you to read it. And you should suspect that I might not be able to, I might not pick up on, and I actually can't, you know, I can't actually, you know, I can't present the digest of this book. And I can't do, you can say, a complete sort of um, representation of what this book is. So it's really just my reading of it some points that I think are important. And then also sometimes I'm gonna go off on a tangent on something that I find relevant in the discussion. So at the end of the day, this really is um, <clears throat> intended to, to um, bring you to read this book. So I hope you all um, have the opportunity to do so. You can get it on Kindle, you can get hard copies and somebody very kindly informed me that if you can't, if you haven't been able to get the hard copy, you can read it on the Shambhala website, the first chapter, at least, the, the introduction of the first chapter. Okay. So, so a little bit about Ziga Kondra Rinpoche. Uh, Rinpoche was born in Bia in Himachal Pradesh. Some of you will know Bia as this place also. Tsongsi Kinsa has the, has his um, his residence. There's also Deer Park. And nearby also you have Chantra, which is 
the the um, the college of Tzadikins Rinpoche. But in Bia, then we have um, something called the well, we generally refer to as the Choling Gomba. What's it called? It's actually called Evam Chogar or something like that. But anyway, this was founded by um, the third Chogya Lingpa, Pema Gyume. And he settled there in Bia together with his family, together with his, his wife, Mayum Seon Palden, a very great practitioner. And uh, if you go to Bia, there's a very great um, stupa there, a great reliquary honoring her. And um, Pema Gyume, Choling Rinpoche unfortunately very sadly passed away, I think it was 1970, 73 or 75 in a car accident, but he was a very, very great Lama and um, the monastery is carried on, particularly by Ujjan Topgyal Rinpoche, his eldest son, and um, it's then here that, that Ziga Kong Rinpoche uh, grew up. Um, Rimaji also has uh, a brother, Jamian Gelson, and a sister, uh, uh, Diki, Diki Wamo. So, um, so anyway, Rimaji was recognized as rebirth of Jamgun Kontru. And um, he studied with his main teacher, Dilgu Kenz Rimaji, and had the honor to uh, meet Rimaji when he was quite young, and I have known him since since so what the late 70s um, and uh, I can testify actually that Sikha Kong Rinpoche was very close with uh, Dilgu Kenz um, well, yeah it was always a delight to be around where um, when Sikha Kong Rinpoche was um, together with Dingo Chenzi Rinpoche and Rinpoche also studied with Tugurujan, Tugurujan Rinpoche, Nyushu Ken Rinpoche and Kempo Rinchen. And um, in the late 90s, then he met Elizabeth, Elizabeth Mattis Namdel, and they uh, together moved to the US. And Rimaji began teaching in the US and he set up this organization called Mangala Shri Bhuti. And you can Google it, you can find the website and so on. Rimaji teaches a fair bit online, so you can participate a fair amount in his teachings. And he's written also quite a few books just to mention a few, there's one called It's Up to You, and also one called Light Coming Through. And um, Rimaji's main teaching really is, is the Longchen Yingqi, the, the Tsokchen tradition, as well as also, of course, uh, upholding the Choling tradition, but mainly, I think, Longchen Yingqi. And Rimaji then also teaches, he of course travels, he's visited Australia, he's visited Europe on many occasions, and he then has centers in Colorado and Vermont in the US. Yeah, O.T. Rinpoche is his brother. Yeah, that's right. So there were four, four, four children of Choling Pema Gyume. So there's O.T., there's Ziga Kong Rinpoche, there's Diki Wangmo, and there's Chamyang Gyalsen, four children. So, um, and also actually Rinpoche has, Ziga Kong Rinpoche also has something called Guna Institute in Bia. So near the, near his father's seat, the, the Choling Monastery. Um, to your right here, we have part, this is actually just a section of one of Rinpoche's works. He's, in, he's um, studied with, with uh, Jan Le Tumlin, a famous French surrealist painter. Incidentally, also mother of um, Matthew Ricard. Uh, and this is a work of his, it's from one of his works, it's called Creation. And Rinpoche, there was just one place where I thought Rinpoche really encapsulates what he wishes to do with this book. And he says, I would like to make a clear case for the tremendous benefits of Tsewa and the importance of keeping your heart open, both for yourself and for others. So this is what we're doing with this study. We are making a case for love, for tenderness, for openness. And this is something that benefits ourselves, benefits others. So there's, um, there's two really good forwards in this work. So I'm just gonna take a few points here. Um, 
there's this universal appreciation for tenderness. And what we want to understand is that this is something uh, universal. Um, but also, as much as this is something universal, it's also something that we very often overlook or we don't prioritize it or we simply are not sufficiently aware of it. So something needs to be done in order for us to properly uncover it. And this is where we need a teacher. So, so um, my children, she, she starts off by quoting Pope, Pope Francis, who has spoken about a revolution of tenderness and how tenderness is something that comes from our interaction with the others. It's something that has to do with our perception of others, reaching out to others and so on. And how this is absolutely uh, essential. And so this is where there's a commonality and there's an agreement here. And Buddhists, they would see this tenderness, not only as something that we need to cultivate, but it's something that we naturally have. It's something that's universally present within all humans and also within all life, all animals. Every sentient being possesses this. So us connecting with this, it's not just that we're cultivating something, um, but it's something of actually abiding or aligning ourselves with something, so a basic goodness that we possess. So we can see this as a, an expression of our Buddha nature. And this, this Buddha nature, of course, is something that shines through. However deluded we might be, it's always there. And in many, many cases, it's something that is present within our being in more or less manifest forms. Um, Pema Chodron quotes her, her teacher, the first root guru, um, the Vijadara Chugyam Trungpa Rinpoche, who said, all beings have the capacity for warm-hearted feelings. Everybody loves somebody or something, even if, even if it's just tortillas. And um, while everyone has this, this capacity, um, Pema Chodron says, although we have this wonderful potential, how to tap into it is far from obvious. And this is where this is where our hearts go out to, you could almost say, particularly modern culture where there's so much data, so much information, and very often a strange alienated relationship with this beautiful quality that is innate to us and such a lack of vehicles or skillful means to actually bring it forth where this is regarded as the highest gift and the highest knowledge in most cultures we cannot go to any university where you can actually receive training in tenderness it's not something that's taught in the schools it's something that's kind of assumed you're supposed to be tender there's sort of a moralistic imperative that hovers around but there's not really clear directions on how to do this so this is where the science of tsewa, the science of tenderness lacks, and also not always that we can find proper guides. Pema Chodron says, and this is speaking about ego control, she says, his ability to communicate the Buddha's wisdom with clarity, humor, and modern day relevance makes his teaching ideal for our times. Most importantly, he embodies the teachings on love and warmth in his daily life, in his relationship and activities, and in his very presence. In other words, Rinpoche practices what he, what he preaches. So we are fortunate to have this, this guide. Then the editor, and the editor being Joseph Waxman. So this is a student of Rinpoche, and um, he tells about how Rinpoche in the context of um, some lectures began to speak about tenderness and then actually really began to, to emphasize this. And so throughout the, I think it was the Buddhist summer school that he was teaching or that he does in his organization, Mangala Sri Bhuti, that he then, um, he began speaking about this at one, on one occasion, but then he actually emphasized this and made this the main topic throughout the 
summer schools that he held that particular summer. And this is then um, where the editor, he says, in theory, and this is, I'm just extracting a few paragraphs from the editor's preface. He says, in theory, sewa, tenderness, is the answer to all our problems. Since we all possess this quality in our own heart, we don't need to depend on acquiring anything from the outside. When our heart is full of this, of its innate warmth, there is no way for anger, greed, confusion, worry, or depression to take hold. But what does this really look like in our own life? In theory, we can all agree to the value of unconditional love and warmth, but our experiences and reactions continually present us with challenges and riddles. How do we apply Tsewa in the midst of the complexity and pressure of our everyday existence? How do we view and approach others with tenderness, even those who arouse our disapproval or contempt? These are questions that we need to work out for ourselves over a long time and with great perseverance. And then he also says, Rinpoche has always encouraged students to lean your openness toward the teaching. This means having some level of trust in their wisdom and in the wisdom of their source, which is the Buddha. At, at the minimum, it means erring on the side of curiosity rather than skepticism. Such a basic level of trust gives us plenty of room to examine and experiment with the teachings, to test them in all situations until we feel personally convinced of their validity. So these two paragraphs, I just like the first one because it speaks about the universality of this. This is something that we all have, and yet the challenge lies in that we need to do this. Um, I've been practicing the Buddhist teaching for some time, and yet I still just am rather held by a fair amount of, um, you could say, limitations in terms of this unconditional love and warmth. So cultivating that is not something that just sort of happens just because we decide that it's the right thing, that we have a fridge magnet maybe that says, remember Tsewa, <laughs> remember, remember tenderness. It's something where it requires that we're proactive. So that's where we need, we need guidance. We need, we need to um, take um, counsel from teachers, from in this case, Ziga Kontrimbaje, from the Buddha and from the teaching. And that's where, because unfortunately, very often Buddhism gets, gets described as a belief system, which it's not. It's something where you actually are encouraged to be very critically minded. But yes, you could say what then defines a Buddhist in terms of Buddhist faith is really that you give the Buddha the benefit of the doubt. And of course, the Buddha comes from a phenomenology of, of enlightenment, which extends far beyond our ordinary experience. So there's going to be a lot of teaching, a lot of things in the Buddha's teaching that actually we don't understand right away, that requires that we actually sit down and ponder. And that's where if we trust somebody, then we, we hear something we don't understand. We kind of, we ponder it. If we don't trust somebody, we don't understand it, we, we just dismiss it. So that's where leaning our openness towards the teaching, that's a really good expression because that's exactly it. We give the Buddha the benefit of the doubt. We, we, um, we have this curiosity because we'd like to know what the Buddha is saying because we trust that the Buddha has, has something of great value. So if we come across something that seems impossible, like compassion for all sentient beings or the the statements like all phenomena are unborn and unceasing, <laughs> things like that, then we might want to just think, hmm, wonder what that actually means. And it's worthwhile pondering it. So this is where we are, we are ultimately encouraged to take ownership of the teaching and experience it for ourselves. Okay. So now this is, this is then beginning Zigo Contra Images teaching and he, he he starts off by saying that in us approaching this picking up this book approaching spirituality in general 
we have two concerns, that of self and others, and they are not in conflict. And he's saying that we could approach this from the point of view of wishing personal peace, wishing to get out of pain, wishing to find something that gives us some stability, some vision. And then we could also be concerned about the, what, what is needed in this world. We can see that there's a lot of pain and angst and suffering in this world. And our concern really could be something of a more universal nature beyond just ourselves. But the thing is, this is not in conflict. And this is where if you come, whenever we come across the, you could say the purpose, if we describe the purpose of the Buddhist teaching, we would say there's two purposes, two goals. And it's very often said the goal of self and other, that's kind of the, the jargon. And that means that Actually, there, these two, they work together. Enlightenment is the serving of the two purposes or the two objectives of self and other. Through our caring for others, we naturally achieve our own um, enlightenment. And through achieving our own enlightenment, self falling away, then we naturally will be of service to others. So these two coexist uh, seamlessly. Ziga um, DZK here, our individual progress benefits the world and others, and our care for the world and others opens our minds and hearts. So we can see these two, they coexist perfectly. We would also say in the, in the Bodhisattva teachings, we say that um, the enlighten, the our own enlightenment is attained on the seat of others, meaning us giving up our own territory and existing in terms of, or you could say, serving and being attentive to the needs of others. This is in alignment with with our own Buddha nature, and this is what uh, dissolves our ordinary attachment to that which holds us in confusion and suffering, namely our self-centering. This is particularly also important um, in this age, because what actually has come about through our increased technological advances um, is that that is regarded really as knowledge. And so the, the thrust of, for the modern educated person lies in something that's intellectual. It can be technology, it can also be within the humanities, ideas, and all of these, they uh, all operate within, you could say, an objective dimension of information, ideas. And it doesn't actually remedy the basic confused condition of focusing on the self and as such being alienated to the other. And this sort of, with this sort of lack of softness that very often comes with the, the modern day um, confusion, suffering, um, predisposition towards just objectivist materialist science, there's an increasing sense of, of um, alienation between self and other, conflict, rigidity, and so forth. We see this both in terms of our own existence on a very sort of ordinary uh, level within our own neighborhood. We also see this in terms of world politics. So as much as we have, uh, we like to congratulate ourselves as having a very sophisticated civilization, there is so much confusion and so much suffering. This materialism has not increased harmony. By its very nature, materialism is simply about what is innate. Or uh, sorry, um, what's <laughs> inanimate? Um, there's a word I'm looking for there. But it basically what we are, what we what we do with materialism is study that which is lifeless, uh, inert. That was the word, <laughs> and uh, and that's where the knowledge is all about. The there are there are there's a large section of our modern civilization large chunk of our demography, large chunk of the population that actually doesn't believe that the consciousness even exists. There's science that tells us that consciousness is something, again, just inert, 
something that's just uh, exists in terms of mm, unconscious biological systems. And so we we um, we live in a strange uh, civilization where we where we very often think uh, in terms of just what is material. Even our med medical system operates with what is um, entirely uh, physical. Understanding our, our our being in terms of chemicals, we think that we can cure illnesses only with what is physical, with with um, material medicine, pills, and so forth. And of course, the the issue here is that what we're talking about, what really what really matters in our lives, love, tenderness, the breaking down of barriers between self and others, that is something that is entirely um, intangible. And so that's where we need to work with the mind. And that's where th that which will remedy this situation of our alienation, the conflict between self and other, on a universal level, really begins from within. So of course, Zico Kondramaji, he very wisely says, it's not as if we can just, this, this, this is not something that's easily addressed. But it is something that, if we think about it, will inevitably have to do with subjectivities or individuals that begin to change from within, softness that, change, that comes from within. Now, for us to do this, we have what it takes. Everyone, of course, if you're a Buddhist, then you would, you would agree, we all have Buddha nature. And this nature is something that is not just something abstract and philosophical or spiritual or mystical. It's a softness that we that we all are familiar with. We all experience this. We are all born with this profound quality. And with that quality, this is actually what leads to our happiness. It's something that we universally can see in ourselves and others, that when we're caring for others, and when others are caring for us, happiness abounds when we are not expecting that others are nice to us, but we're more concerned about how we can, we can be there for others, we can see how much lighter we are. And we can look at others who actually have that quality of just wishing to give to others, that sort of natural quality of being without expectation and demands and actually just caring, having this tenderness. We can see how much, how, how better they're off and how much more happiness there is. How you could say really the potential of the human condition manifests. Zico Kontrimaji says, what is, this, what is this profound quality that we all have? It is the innate tenderness of our own heart. Every sentient being is endowed with a heart that is capable of having warm, tender feelings toward others. Even in vicious creatures like a snake, we can see evidence of this quality in its tender behavior towards its young. No one is unfortunate enough to be born without such a heart. So this is where we would say this Buddha nature is present in all beings. Of course, we could say in some beings, there's less of it. Sometimes it's not, we would say, the, the, the um, Tibetan word is jikse, which means the 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 seed or the potential basically lineage actually that the lineage it it um, it awakens so sometimes it's more or less awakened and of course we might say there's some beings where it's very thoroughly hidden but there's not a single being that doesn't have it ultimately Ziga Kontramaja says when it is warm with tenderness and affection towards others our own heart can give us the most pure and profound happiness that exists and enable us to radiate that happiness to others. This potential for happiness is right here within us. It is not something on the outside for which we need to search or strive. We don't need to get several university degrees, work hard and save up a lot, a lot of money. We only need this heart, which is right here with us, accessible at all times. So this is good news. It's not something that we need to um, acquire 
over years of sort of hard labor. It's not that we would be incredibly lucky. We might look at others and say, oh, that person naturally has a good disposition. Yeah, that's true, but we have it too. It's really just a, a question of whether or not we're tapping into it, whether we're cultivating it, whether we're connecting with it. And it is something that abides with us at all times. It's, it's, it is accessible in every, every moment. So we might say, well, all sentient beings, they have this. It's just there. We might think, oh, well, that's way too simplistic. And of course, I think we need to, we need to, um, we need to appreciate Ziegler Kultur Rinpoche for his exposure to the Western mind and the Western skepticism that, of course, wouldn't just say, oh, yes, that's, that's a given. We, we live in a culture where there is this unfortunate, sad belief that um, that we might be ultimately basically selfish, you know, the survival of the fitness, of the fittest, sorry, <laughs> the survival of the fittest um, from Charles Darwin, or we might have the likes of Richard Dawkins, the selfish gene. And it's, you can say very often, it's basic to a sort of a, a disillusion with humanity that sort of gradually embraced Western civilization in the course of the 20th century, that there's the, the sort of the, the assumption that humans are basically flawed. And this is wh where the, the Buddha would like to, to, this is what the Buddha would like to challenge. This is where we presently would like to, would to lean, into the, lean into the teaching, trust what the Buddha uh, would like to present here. And in fact, we intuitively, appreciate this because it's it's on the basis of of this softness that we actually ourselves experience our being flourishing um, but yes for the time being it looks like there there is a lot of suffering and confusion in the world and Ziga Kontrum says this is because this nature is hidden to us as a buried treasure as we know from the Uttara Tantra Shastra, we sometimes give the example of Buddha nature, this hidden disposition, this with all the qualities, as something that, that's there, but we just don't know. Just like a homeless poor person that doesn't know that they actually are sitting on top of a buried treasure. The thing is that we needn't think of it as being that far away. And it's something that we all experience. We all experience tenderness, for our pets, for others. We all experience love. We all experience um, um, affection. So we all have this, um, this ideal, or not ideal, but we all have this experience of something very pure that exists within, within uh, our relationship with others that is the best that there is. There's nothing more beautiful. And of course, we have a million love songs and a, a, a million, million different representations in our culture of how much we appreciate this. So while this tenderness is generally conditioned, we do experience it. So we're going to have it for some people. We're going to have it more for some, less for others, and so on. It comes and goes. We'll have tremendous sympathy sometimes for people that we feel deserve it and we'll have less sympathy for people that we feel don't deserve it but universally this is something that we certainly experience and this is a place where we we experience something that goes outside of ourselves it's a place where we feel a warm connection to others of course we could we could consolidate ourselves saying i don't want to get hurt i'm just going to be good in myself and we'd want to have little contact with with uh, others um, but that's that's a sad place and there's something very beautiful that takes place when we have this warm connection to others um, like i was just saying we celebrate this in our cult in a culture with so many different terms we have words for it like love affection but the thing is also 
when we talk about love, then very often we, you know, we have this sort of um, sometimes disillusion with love. Sometimes we have disillusion with with our relationships um, of many many kinds. Of course, love relationships, uh, relationships within our families, relationship within our social um, context, and so forth. And sometimes we we're disappointed. And and from this point of view, then sometimes there's a notion that almost by definition, something like love is you know many different um, many different things. But what we're going to be talking about here, and what Zero Contra wishes us to train in, is something that is um, untainted, and something that essentially within the Buddhist context we refer to as bodhicitta. But Rinpoche very wisely avoids using this Sanskrit term because of course that comes again with a lot of connotations of very mystical kind. You could have bodhicitta as it's taught in the Lojong teachings, as we have it in the Majamika teachings, as we have it in the in the Kunche Jalpo, in the Tsokchen teachings and so forth. Um, so bodhicitta also uh, comes with a lot of connotations and what Rinpoche really would like to is for us to just have that immediate visceral sense of warmth, which where the word tenderness and where the word tsiwa seems to be quite appropriate. Then again, Zigo Kontrum, which says, but even the terms, the term tsiwa, if we use it too much, can start to outshine the actual experience. The word can start to seem more important than its meaning. Of course, in writing a book, one must use words, but please keep this, these caveats in mind and try not to let the true meaning of the words drift into something abstract. So his point here, and this is really important, he would like us to, to not understand necessarily all the theory, but actually to feel this. This is about, we could say this is a study, but the thing is, it's a study about something that we could actually have a visceral experience of, we could actually feel it. And with Rinpoche's appeal to our intuitive appreciation for how we actually experience this, um, we're talking about something that we we um, we feel, experience, and we shouldn't get lost in in the words, in the language. Rinpoche says, "The tender, open heart of Tsewa is an infinitely malleable resource. It expresses itself as kindness." compassion, vicarious, joy, generosity, tolerance, mental clarity, courage, resilience, unshakable cheerfulness, and in many other internal ways. It also manifests outwardly in our positive actions. Everything we do for the benefit of others or for the sake of opening our own hearts comes from this fundamental quality of tsewa. In this way, tsewa it's really the, the source of all goodness in the world. Now we see courage, we see compassion, generosity, unshakable cheerfulness. We see this and we rejoice in it. And when we rejoice in it, we might say, oh gosh, I'm so depressed, I don't have this, you know, these people there have so much kindness, I don't have that. The thing is, the, main, the very fact that we can recognize kindness in others, that we, can, that we can recognize courage, is because we actually possess the language. Otherwise, it would just seem utterly bizarre and we couldn't make sense of it. But we can make sense of it. And it's so something that we own. And we see this, you could say this light shining through so many places in our lives. It happens. And so we see these manifestations of this goodness everywhere. And this is where we, we'd want to appreciate that we have this common ground with all sentient beings. We share this with everyone. The inside of Tsewa is like oxygen, yet overlooked in a materialistic world. So this is something that, of course, is essential. But as far as the materialistic world uh, goes, it's not really part of the 
the science of the language. It's something everybody experiences, but when we talk about materialism as such, and the agenda and the beliefs and the assumptions that's basic to a world that just operates with data and physicality and so forth, um, then there's not really an understanding of it. Of course, the how the modern world got itself into sort of painted itself into this corner we can we can analyze through a history of western thought and ideas and philosophies um, but we're not going to do that here we're we're just appreciating that it's not something that is taught and readily understood within the materialistic world and yet we understand it and everybody understands it so it's something that that while it's overlooked, perhaps in an academic sense, it's something that everybody lives with. Unfortunately, then, as you say, modern culture begins to sort of permeate um, the, the planet at large, then also we have cultures in which this used to be sort of, you could say, the main focus, and particularly in Tibet, where you could say the Tibetan identity actually is tied up with the value of compassion even there people are beginning to lose sight of it so so Rinpoche makes a point about this that even in places like tibet people begin to give up on the value of kindness we also see in the modern world when people fight for justice they sometimes do that with tremendous aggression and anger towards those that they consider uh, representing injustice this is this is rampant and that's a, the point really is that, that we would be much more effective in fighting for justice and much more skillful in dealing with, you could say, the opposition if we have love and affection for them. We are much better at dealing with persons, you could say, that, that might have some delusion if we care for them, if we feel a soft spot for them. So that's where, also a bit like in martial arts, if there's not fear, and you actually can you could go with the with the energy of the other then actually you can turn their aggression into something that works for the for you could say for the objective that you're seeking so if we're fighting for justice doing that without love and affection actually it's um, counterproductive but we can see how it's sadly missing so often when we talk about uh, politics and things get polarized so Rinpoche would like us to reconsider the importance of tenderness. That's what he's going to be doing here. And basically, he says here at this point, he'd like us to, to reconsider how important this is. And of course, we say, well, I know that. But the thing is, it's so valuable to actually have it repeated from so many different angles. And this also, this also reflects the incredible richness in the in the the they would say the um the dharma or the what we call the the um, dharma of transmission uh in terms of the teaching the incredible uh, body of advice that exists after 2500 years since the buddha and so we have these two uh, objectives remember has these two objectives one is to make us aware of how important tenderness is and then also he'll be drawing on so much advice from his Buddhist teachers. So this is um, this is um, a, trim, a great gem, really, where he opens our eyes to something of key importance, and he has so much to offer us in terms of actually uh, proactively cultivating this. Rinpoche says, since I believe that Sewa is the most valuable resource human beings possess, I hope to help you remove whatever impediments uh, are keeping it hidden in darkness so you can live a life full of joy, meaning, and profound value to the world. So, chapter one, Black Oxygen. Now, we have come into this world nurtured by our mother's affection. So like Rimji says, we're not like, 
or not like he says, but Rumiji makes a point about that. We are not like weeds that grow easily without caring attention, you know? Um, of course, within modern psychology, uh, we very often look at the mind as something that has a history and is shaped uh, by causes and conditions. And that, of course, is true. Um, but we sometimes fail um, to understand the complexity of, of our reality. And so when we might identify some complications in terms of our parents, possibly our mother, and so forth, then we sometimes overlook how that the complications or issues we might have there, um, you could say are they're complex. Um, the the um, the practice of blaming uh, our parents or our mothers um, unfortunately overshadows the inevitable fact that every child actually would have come into this world on the basis of a lot of attention from their parents, from their mothers. And so we have, regardless of what we might think and what we might fixate on, we actually have received a lot of affection. We would have been, we would have been looked after our mothers generally. Of course, there would be exceptions, not making, you can't make, of course, a complete generalization, but generally we would have received a lot of affection from this person who would get up in the middle of the night, who would uh, nurse us, who would attend to us, keep us clean, be uh, continually uh, attentive to our needs and so forth. So that is where, and Rimbach's point here is that we really have received a lot of attention. Um, we've received a lot of love. So this is a point that we very often fail to dwell on. Very often when people talk about their parents, they'll begin to talk about the complications um, and the pain and the difficulty. Um, in Asian cultures, there is a cultural practice of honoring the elders. And you could say, well, that's just a cultural practice. It's, it might not be genuine, but it nevertheless leads to an attention to and a recognition of the indebted nature that we, we as children really uh, have in relation to our, our parents. And so um, we would want to ponder this. In the Buddhist teaching, even within Asian cultures where there already exists such a culture, there is a lot of, in the Buddhist training, there's a lot of attention and a lot of um, time allocated to pondering the kindness of our mother. And of course, this is also, um, you could say, joined up with a recognition that uh, given that our consciousness is not something that just comes out of a brain or some sort of unconscious matter or biological systems, we would have had many, many lifetimes. We have been re-embodied many times. And every time we have received a lot of uh, love from our mother. So we speak about in the Buddhist teaching, all mother sentient beings. And so pondering what we received from our mother, we also begin to understand that, that uh, this really extends to, to other sentient beings as well. We've actually, we're indebted to other sentient beings ourselves. Many of us are parents. We know how much love we pour into our children, how much attention we give them. So that's where we understand that there's a universal phenomenon of giving and of caring and love that takes place. And this is something that, that has nourished us and created us as the person we are. We might be warm, good persons that are able to relate to others. And that is very much has a lot to do with this, this love that has been poured into us, whether we're conscious of it or not. So we function on the basis of having received this tsewa. Rimbaud says, thanks to receiving tsewa, you have become an adult capable of standing on your own two feet. Thanks to tsewa, you can now look after yourself and your family and contribute something to society. 
if you hadn't received so much love throughout your life, you would not feel any security or strength inside. You would not have a sound mind. So we would want to try to focus on this, this sewa or this tenderness that we have been on the receiving end of and appreciate this, this um, as the foundation really for our sanity. Remember, this is our well-being also depends on our expressing sewa to others. From early childhood, we have been learning to open our hearts to parents, siblings, friends, and pets. If our hearts had never developed the ability to feel warmth towards others, if there was no one toward whom we felt tenderness, closeness, and trust, we would now be in a state of painful isolation. Our mind would be imprisoned in a miserable state of narcissism. Luckily, this is not the case. We might experience this at times. We might actually sometimes in our insecurity isolate ourselves and not be able to extend ourselves. But we can also then see, and this is what Rinpoche very much is encouraging us, we can begin to see what states of mind actually bring us out, bring us up, and what bring us down. And we can also see in others, we can see it in our own children, we can see it in our friends, that when, when they fail, when they have a hard time opening up and relating to others, when they fail in sort of connecting with others through their hearts, it's something that, that leads to isolation and sadness. So this ability to express sewa, to express tenderness, this is key, really, in us developing fully as humans, as human beings. Not as if this is something that we should. We should be human beings in a, in a particular way. But it's simply being true to what we innately are. For us to connect and to fully realize what we are, to develop our potential, if you like, it, it comes on the basis of this expressing tsewa. and. In doing so, we're simply just connecting with what is always there. You could say it's a bit like the sun of Tsewa is always behind the clouds. And what we're doing when we're expressing Tsewa is that we're beginning to align ourselves and connect with this, this source. Now, Rupert is phrasing this in what we could almost call secular terms. And, you know, we. In the Buddhist teaching, we talk about enlightenment. And um, when, we, when, we, when we appreciate how tsewa really can exist in terms of being unconditional, it's rare that we find this in, in ordinary cultures and societies. It's quite extraordinary. And when there is someone who really possesses unconditional um, Sewa or tenderness, well, that is extraordinary. These persons are beacons of our civilization, the beacons of society. They're outstanding individuals. And so we have an appreciation for this, such a phenomenon as sages, wise persons, more or less, but we would say someone like the Buddha represents the full awakened aspect of that. Our teacher, such as His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Tsongsa Genza Rinpoche, all the great teachers like His Holiness Saka Chinsen, the Kamapa, and so on, these represent the potential we have for freedom. And yet we also have within ourselves, we have many times places where we actually experience all sorts of uh, aspects of freedom and fortune. And that's where we ourselves, when we have this quality that we're talking about here, we should ex examine and understand where it comes from. So this is where we understand that this, what Rinpoche has just been talking about, receiving and giving tsewa, this really is essential for us in our lives. And it is there where we actually begin to break out of our shell, where we break out of our um, narrowness and isolation where we begin to really thrive. And this is where this 
giving and receiving sewa, it is like oxygen. So Rimaji says, just like our lungs yearn for oxygen, our hearts, our heart always yearns to be open, to give and receive sewa. When we shut down, and we might do so, we might be hurt, we might be disillusioned, we might be angry, we suffer. Nobody benefits from that. And that's where we, at that point, we, we don't breathe. We're, we're not well. So the whole, you could say the dynamic, the experience of, of breathing, this sewa is essential to our well-being. All beings wish for happiness, just as we ourselves do. This, of course, is something that you always hear in the Buddhist teaching. All beings wish for happiness, and yet in failing to do so, uh, or rather, all beings wish for happiness, failing to understand what really the causes of happiness are, sentient beings perpetuate their own suffering. So we would say their intention and their actions stand in contradiction. So we, we understand this every micro moment. We are, we are actually, we are yearning for happiness. We actually need sewa all the time. So this is something that exists at all times, day after day, year after year, life after life, across all cultures, all beings, all races, all the six realms of sentient beings. All of these beings, they thrive on the basis of tsewa. Rimaji is making a point about that. Do we really have any, <coughs> any happiness without tsewa? We could, of course, we could get, <coughs> we could get some, something that gives us, you say, temporary gratification. We could get some device. We could get something material. We could get some degree of affection. We could give some recognition or status or something that we desire that's external to us. But like Rimaji says, try and look. We might get what we want, but is our heart still open? That's the thing. And even though we might not get what we want, if we look at our heart, that it's if our heart has love, it has tenderness, then we have actually the wealth of contentment. Now, we're not saying that on the basis of having tsewa, then um, we don't, or rather, um, we, we're not saying that um, there's something wrong in having, getting what we want. Um, and the thing is that we're just so much better when there is, uh, when, we, when we have tsewa. We appreciate what we have much more, and we can, we're much more, uh, autonomous and robust uh, when we don't get, when we don't necessarily get it. So there's not a contradiction here. Our short-term wishes might complement the happiness of tsewa. So of course we might have some, some um, we might have some good circumstances, and within that, yes, then tsewa can flourish. Um, but the thing is, if we just focus on let's say the sort of hedonistic project of just being gratified, having good food, having good sex, having wealth, having some degree of security, then without actually having this genuine tenderness, these really just provide short-lived pleasures, short-lived gratification. Rimaji says, now I'm not saying these things have nothing to do with being happy referring to, you could say, all these sort of external objects. In the short term, they may well contribute to happiness, but they are not its ever-flowing, inexhaustible source. Accompanied by tsewa, all of these and many other things as well can complement our happiness. But without tsewa, each is just a shell of happiness, an empty, lifeless shell. So that's where we could have all these things. And of course, this is a, almost like a cliche, but it's something that we fall for. It's a deception we fall for again and again, this, this notion that if only I had this, everything would just be so fine. And the thing is, if we get that, it's just, it doesn't last. So that's where 
just getting the things that we want, it's essentially it's never going to make us happy. And without really tsewa, without this, this oxygen of giving, it's just an empty, lifeless shell. So humans possess a unique intelligence, the ability to self-reflect. Rinpoche gives these examples of how, you know, with with um, the right motivation and the right sort of circumstances, somebody can can uh, pursue what they want. And this stands a little bit in in um, contrast to other realms. And for example, we can see animals that they, of course. They can they can be they can be very skilled in terms of just their survival and incredibly intelligent in so many different um, in so many different ways, but they lack this ability to self-reflect to ponder what is this mind what is this consciousness that 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 I'm continually operating from what is the nature of that and that is not because this you could say oh well, that's just that makes everything so complicated that's the beauty of animals they don't reflect on these <laughs> complicated issues but the thing is it's actually on the basis of us you could say redressing or um, ameliorating improving our ability towards something like sewa that we actually can improve our happiness uh, I remember Tonsukin Ramaji once pointing to something that we have in the Buddhist teaching that we would what defines the higher realms is actually that we understand the causes of happiness and suffering. And in the lower realms, we don't. We're just driven by our reactive patterns. So that's where the higher realms is where we have this self-reflection and we can actually attune ourselves towards or um, we can be wise in terms of the choices that we make in terms of what brings happiness. The point is, and this of course is something that we come back to in terms of our habitual patterns, that we often act against our own intention to be happy. We actually do things that that that, that bring about our own suffering. So we might, uh, in anger, uh, assault or verbally assault or in some way um, be aggressive and this this drives our own suffering this is where we despite us being happy us being aggressive is not going to bring our happiness despite us actually wishing happiness being uh, driven by desire and greed it really just constructs an impoverished mind it, impo it, it constructs more suffering so with aggression, we construct the corresponding mind of alienation and um, rigidity and um, suffering from within and also in terms of our perception of the world around us. And also with, with desire, we, on the basis of our selfishness and greed, we solidify this, this sense of poverty from within. And so our actions, they go against our intentions to be happy. This is this is what we mean with karma, that we're actually constructing our being through our actions. And if we are perpetual, if we're engaging in actions that actually solidify um, conditions of suffering, well, we can't blame anybody else. So Rupert says, how well do we how well do we look at cause and effect? And connect the dots of our lives. How well do we distinguish what fulfills our intention to be happy from what sabotages our well-being? And if we do see that we're acting against our intentions, how do we change course? If our way of go going about being happy isn't working or is even adding to our suffering, how willing and able are we to try a different approach? And that's actually where we where we have a big advantage in the Buddhist teaching because what we're talking about here, of course, is something that to some extent is answered within the moral theory and the moral praxis that we see in human societies. But very often there's a fight that takes place between what we think we ought to do and what we want to do. And that's where the Buddha's approach of softening the mind, understanding the 
absence of self and understanding that we're not up, up fighting against anything. We're just having a moment of delusion that is nothing but a delusion. It's a figment of our imagination, this rigidity of our impulses. And that's where also the practice of meditation is indispensable in terms of letting go of our ordinary sustaining of narratives that perpetuate this self. So that's where we could, in the Buddhist teaching, be very creative in terms of sitting down and looking at how can we change course? Because we're not about to fight with ourselves. We're simply about having some clarity, some vipassana, some an aerial perspective, a sense of humor about ourselves that enables us to actually make choices freely. And that's where it's not that difficult. But we need to initially at least have just this introspection that recognizes that we are not doing the things that necessarily are bringing about happiness. So we might be told about the value of Tsewa, but we need to assert this for ourselves. And this, of course, comes down to what when we talk about the three prajnas, that we hear the teachings, but then we need to think critically about them. Otherwise, we're not going to own the teaching. We need to think, is this true? Just, just saying yes, sir, to the Buddha, we actually just have a small faith. It's a very simplistic faith that actually doesn't go very deep. But as we actually question and critically assess whether or not this, this holds true, then it takes on, when we arrive at a conclusion, this takes on a lot of weight and authority within our choices. So that's where we, it's not enough that we just um, accept some dogma, but we need to actually verify for ourselves. Ramajan says, even though the Buddha and many other sages have identified the tender heart as the source of all goodness in the, heart, in the world, we have to ponder this matter for ourselves until we're convinced. We have to examine and reflect on our own lives and the lives of others. I can say to you that Sewa is like oxygen, but do you see this in your own experience? I would be very surprised if you or anyone else could be happy without Sewa. But I'm not in your mind. It is up to you to look into this for yourself. So Rinpoche is encouraging us to apply this unique ability that we have as humans for self-reflection, introspection, that we look into ourselves and understand how, how certain choices and impulses drive suffering and certain drive happiness, certain drive this heart of tsewa, this heart of goodness, this tender heart of goodness. So this is where we ourselves need to begin to connect to this oxygen. We all know it, but we, we need to tap into it. And that's where every time we do anything really in terms of the Buddhist path, whether it's practicing generosity or patience or meditating or studying, it's actually connecting us to this oxygen. So it all, you could say, connects with this life-giving condition of bodhicitta or sewa. Ask if a moment of gratification leaves our heart open and warm. Yeah? This is where we can see we get what we want, a new pair of shoes, a new car. And that's great. We feel good about that. But is our heart still open and warm? If we're, if we're still fixated on this me, is that happiness? The thing is, we're being, we're being satisfied, but that me, that still sits there as something that's gnawing at us. So that's where you could say that's sapping up the, the oxygen. So that's where we're not particularly giving ourselves more oxygen by just being gratified. Whether things are that bad, if our heart remains open and contented, so we might not get what we might not get the new pair of shoes. <laughs> we might somebody might have scratched our car. We might have faced very difficult circumstances of many kinds. We might be ill. We might lose somebody that we care for. And it's never ever going to be easy being a human being. 
we are constantly overwhelmed by what we call the four great rivers of, of suffering. But the thing is, we can't change these circumstances, but if we sustain a heart that's open and contented, then there's much greater ability to deal with the really difficult issues. And that is where we can begin to train in this, in this, in the small, in the observing our own mind, how it operates within a small context, you know? So we might not get that coffee, or we might not be able to take the walk, or we might not be able to just have a, something that we are sort of longing for. And yet, if we have openness and contentment, if we have this oxygen happening, then maybe things aren't that bad after all. So this is where it's essential in view of the really big issues that we're going to be facing that we begin to train in, in this quality of softness and connecting with this oxygen while we actually have the leisure and the ability to, to do so. So we ask, is the fulfilled desire the cause of my well-being or is it the tsewa? So what is it really that's going to give us happiness? Is it the object? Is it the thing, the, the, the gimmick, the external source? Or is it this, this quality of tsewa, love, tenderness? Rinpoche says, co contrasting these alternating experiences of open and closed heart heightens our awareness. Without this kind of investigation, we could feel uneasy all the time without really noticing. We could assume that our good external conditions must be making us happy without realizing how anxious or insecure we feel inside. And again, this is where our heart goes out because very often we're not equipped. Many persons are not equipped with any kind of vision. There's the, the a complete lack of imagination um, where there's not a sense that there could be anything more than just being than just happiness on the basis of gratification. But even though we might say, well, I'm, I'm pursuing the spiritual path, I'm above that, I have this introspection, I have this self-reflection, we still fall for deception again and again. And that's where again and again we need to actually investigate and see what really it is that um, is giving us happiness and what, what isn't. So it's essential that we observe our mind to see what brings genuine happiness. That we're going to have to do. This will empower our own critical intelligence. The thing is, when we begin to discover this oxygen and we begin to see what actually brings genuine happiness, we also begin to um, have a sense of autonomy and trust in our own intelligence. So this is where we begin to have some sense of empowerment, some sense of uh, settling into um, a condition of confidence. So again, it's so important that our engaging with this, this topic that we're talking about here, genuine happiness on the basis of this, the oxygen of tsewa, that it's something that we don't approach just as a dogma, like, oh yeah, oh, Oh yeah, okay, that works, I'll do that, you know. But it's really on the basis of thinking critically. So so to swallow the idea of tsewa uncritically will not bring the optimal result. We'll have a little faith, but it's not a deep faith. Rimajit says, it's always helpful to be open-minded about the Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha, but to swallow them without any examination will not bring the optimal result. Only direct experience and self-reflection will profoundly affect the course of your life and mind. And again, um, the famous quote from the Buddha where he says, you know, um, please do not accept my teaching out of respect for my person, but on the basis of your own inquiry. So we establish that pursuing happiness in external circumstances will deceive us. We're not saying external circumstances like comfort and so forth. There's something wrong in it. But if we put all our hopes in it, then we'll be disappointed. We might become addicted to external causes of happiness. And that is what is so sad. And that leads to a lot of disappointment. 
So it doesn't, what Rinpoche is saying and what the Buddha is saying and what we have everywhere in the Buddhist teaching, we're not saying that we shouldn't have pleasures, but the thing is we shouldn't be addicted to them. We shouldn't expect that they will give us ultimate, ultimate uh, pleasure. And sometimes also when we are fooled actually to be sort of lured in to some unconscious, uh, mindless, uh, experience of um, of just re receiving external gratification, then we actually emerge depleted, and actually there's sort of a hangover that comes with that. But again, we're not a being we're not promoting some sort of um, moralistic approach where you're not supposed to have pleasures, but it's more that you're not deceived by it, not caught by it. So this is something universal. So Rimuji brings this into sort of a, 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 um, a context of the various, you say, systems that promote human well-being on the basis of love. And he says, Muslims, Hindus, Christians, and Buddhists are equally in need of tsewa. For all members of these groups, the experience of the tender heart is the same. For all of them, this warm heart is the source of everything positive in the world. Tsewa predates the world's religions. It is part of nature's design. There is nothing religious about keeping one's heart open and giving and receiving love. Any religion that fails to cherish and promote Sewa becomes an artificial religion, a dogmatic religion. Its purpose is something other than the welfare of beings. Fortunately, none of the major religions are like this. Islam, Hinduism, Christianity, Buddhism, and the other great religions of this world all honor and foster tsewa. Of course, in every group, there are people who miss the point of the religion. They fail to connect their religion to the universal quest for happiness and freedom from suffering. This kind of attitude, as we often see, can become anti-tsewa, sabotaging rather than promoting the warm heart that is important to our well-being as oxygen, that is as important to our well-being as oxygen. So this is where we might have systems that promote this and we can see they become rigid. But then we might go, well, in that case, I don't want to have anything to do with systems. But the thing is, it's not that there's something wrong with the systems as such. It's the, it's the confused subjects or the confused persons, the confused individuals that distort and corrupt the ideas of these systems, but then might go on to claim that they're following these systems, that's where we end up with dogma, we end up with sectarianism, we end up with, with conflict. But we should re recognize that this, as you say, the inspiration that we have in all these great, you could say, systems, um, that all these great paths, religions, and so on, that they, they are based on a vision of this profound goodness, this tsewa. So we all need and give tsewa, despite however we appear. So there, then there, Rinpoche gives this example of what's it called, Lonesome Dove, some TV series with uh, Tommy, Tommy Lee Jones that plays, uh, I think, Captain, Captain something or other. Anyway, who's apparently a gruff person. <coughs> I, I saw, I found episode one on YouTube, so you can, you can do research there. But anyway. Um, his point is that this person uh, is someone that is vulnerable and, in fact, despite the gruff external um, appearance, is someone that on one hand needs love and also gives love and is operating very much from the premise of Sewa. So, so despite what the appearances might be like, it's something that, that permeates um, people everywhere and it's something that we sometimes we don't actually know how it, it manifests. So we can establish that we all need sewa, regardless of what we think and what we do. And this, this softness of sewa is our strength, not our weakness. This also is a very common human uh, error, really, that we think I shouldn't show my weakness. Um, 
And of course, we could sometimes say, yes, we might keep it a little bit, our weakness a little bit in check, but we should certainly appreciate this raw, vulnerable heart. So regardless of whether we, how it manifests externally, we should never regard that as being a problem that we actually feel. So Sewa is what puts us in contact with our heart, with the, with the greater reality. Of course, the one thing is to be vulnerable in the sense of being just um, concerned about our own me and I've been hurt or I'm not getting what I want. And the other one is the one of giving, the one of loving, the greatness, the magnanimity, the greatness of mind, the greatness of heart. And that's where this is something that connects us uh, to happiness, to others, to a greater reality. When we have sewa, we're not tripped up by by petty concerns, and we're able to make wise choices. We can go beyond selfishness. And that's why we can see we have two kinds of agendas that work um, without that being surprisingly, one works for our own misery and the other works for our own happiness, and that is selfishness um, and selflessness. So we shouldn't confuse these with moralistic uh, behaviorist aspects that we should behave selfish or, or we behave selfless. That's not what it's about. It's about what's happening inside the heart. So again, forget about the behavior aspect, but looking at whether we have this tenderness, this softness, this love for others, that's what's going to make a difference. Rimaji says the first experience is that me referring to selfishness is that of being fixated on our own agendas. Continually engaged in various forms of struggle to accomplish those agendas, we become tighter and more fearful in our heart. Continually engaged in various forms of struggle to accomplish those agendas, we become tighter and more fearful in our heart. We develop a strong sense of like and dislike, friend and foe, which in turn makes us susceptible to painful emotions and constantly poised to react on behalf of the small mind itself. So without wanting to allude to any present day political events, we can see this plays out both in <laughs> this plays out both in terms of the macrocosmos and in terms of the microcosmos. It plays out in terms of we can see it in others and it's also something that we can see happening within ourselves. This is something that again is identified in terms of our self-reflection, our introspection. We can see it happening in ourselves also. The other primary experience we could move toward is that of an open heart continually emanating good wishes on behalf of others and receiving their warmth with grace and ease. Free from strong prejudices and biases, we gain the confidence of being able to love others unconditionally. We are in harmony with the world, with other beings, and with ourselves. The first option is the way of conventional modern life, the pursuit of external happiness, which never lasts or fulfills. The second option is the way of the great sages, the total reliance on Sewa. It is in its simplest form. Can we state our choice in this way? Do we want to have an open heart? Or a closed heart. So of course here we're not condemning modern life, but we are we are criticizing whether this this culture that just identifies happiness on the basis of external um, external objects, whether this is something that actually fulfills us really. You know, a whole culture of just pursuing comfort, and then you have the the other way, which is reliance on this sacred quality that's innate, that's basic to us, that of course requires, um, requires greatness of mind, but also is what ultimately gives us real fulfillment. So one is one that is based on this self-centering, the agenda of wanting something for me, and the, the other is the one that is sensitive to the other, and which is then that of the open heart. Which do we want? 
So next time, please read chapters two and three. The tender heart is the seed. The tender heart is water. Those of you who have studied uh, Majami Kavatara will remember Chandra Kirti saying that bodhicitta is both the seed at the beginning, it's the water and in the middle, and at the end, it's that which blossoms into benefiting both ourselves and others as the as the fruition, as the fruit. So we're going to look at how this tender heart, how it how it exists within us, and how it is that which also nourishes us. So then there's a few questions here. Um, does it mean that Sewa is not unique in Buddhism among all other religion systems? Yeah, you can find Sewa. Good question. You know, you can find Sewa everywhere. What is what is unique in, in Buddhism is that we understand how absolute truth is unconditional, where Tsewa, the ultimate kind of love, exists without any reference point of self and other. And that is what we call emptiness. That is what we call wisdom. And that's where there's no reference to a self. Because otherwise, we could have Tsewa very much from the point of view of I am kind to others. And that brings happiness. So there's no poo pooing that. But it's not ultimate freedom. So that's where um, the ultimate kind of tsewa necessarily is what we would call the non-referential tsewa, that which doesn't operate within duality. So we'll probably be touching on that as well. Okay. Thank you for joining me here. So we'll just make we'll conclude with a a um, short aspiration that I think many of you are familiar with. May Bodhicitta, precious and sublime, arise where it has not yet come to be, and where it has arisen, may it never fail, but grow and flourish ever more and more. Thank you. And here we are, you say we could identify um, Tsewa, tenderness and Bodhicitta. Yeah. Oh yes. And it's loss are coming up. So um, we have the iron ox year coming up. We're saying goodbye to the iron mouse and uh, wishing you all the very best for for um, the new year. So um, hopefully tomorrow morning, then you can do some some uh, some sow some positive seeds of sewa. The Tibetans would always say, try before noon, at least before noon, to just have positive thoughts and positive conversations. You know, so maybe don't maybe don't look at the news. <laughs> <laughs> but um, to uh, to start the year with with some some good thoughts, some tenderness. Anyway, all the very best wishes. See you next week. Yes, thanks and happy house cleaning day. That's right. We're cleaning our houses now.